going to change gear slightly for this opening session this afternoon. Um, some of you may be aware that yesterday afternoon, Guy, Guy Daniels and the Telecom TV team ran a, a cloud native workshop upstairs in one of the lecture theatres up here uh, to try and get a handle on the whole uh, sort of cloud native. And, and I think that fits in very much with the discussion, you know, Matt talked about from Telstra about where people are on that digital journey. So if I, if I can be uh, sort of abuse the term and say, you know, where are we on that cloud journey? So in order to do that, this is not really a debate, this is more informational and trying to get in input from the different uh, telecoms organizations or CSPs. So I would like to welcome to stage, to the stage rather, uh, Beth Cohen from Verizon, Franz Sizer from Deutsche Telekom, Marcus Brunner from Swisscom, and Vittorio, and I've forgotten your family name, Vittorio. I want to say Bosato. That was close, wasn't it? From, uh, from three. Thank you, please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the, the, reason, the reason I sort of changed, changed format a little bit for this one was that, you know, it's, there's so many aspects to the journey. I think this came out in some of the discussion points in, in some of the, the early debates. Uh, so what, I've asked, what I've, I would like to ask each of you to do is just give a, a quick introduction. I'm not giving you time limit because some people have more to say than others, but just about this journey, where we are on the journey. You know, we touched upon some of the issues around cloudification, we touched upon the different markets, we touched upon, so could you please exp explain to us who you are, your role within the organization, and then your, your thoughts around, and we say cloud, around the hyperscalers, all those. Uh, Beth, could we start with you please from Verizon? Sure. So um, I'm uh, Beth Cohen, and I work in the um, product organization on the business side and responsible for the software-defined networking product suite. Um, and I'd like to talk about um, our, our cloud journey. Uh, so Verizon, uh, you, you know, the title is five years. Well, we've been doing cloud for at least five years. So I'm kind of scratching my head about that one. Um, so our network runs on the cloud now. Um, it's an open stack cloud uh, for the most part. Uh, and we've been running it successfully for quite a while. And uh, 5G is 100% cloud and it has to be. Um, and what does cloud get us? It gets um, a greater deal of flexibility. Um, we stand up um, new services faster. Um, and uh, it, it helps us uh, withstand the fact that technology is changing at an incredibly rapid rate. And uh, so using cloud services allows us to get there that much faster, um, particularly based on the conversation yesterday around cloud native. Um, you know, still, I, would, I will say right now that the majority of what we're running is still VM-based, uh, you know, virtual machine-based, but um, there is definitely a push, and all the vendors out there, please, we need, we need to get there, um, to, to um, <clears throat> get more container, containerized and, and more cloud-native. Um, we have a, a range of, of uh, vendors, I'll say. I do want to touch, so internally, I would say we're very cloud native, or, or rather very cloudified. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on our external um, cloud um, <clears throat> services. Um, as many of you are probably aware, is uh, we, we attempted to, to um, compete with AWS about uh, five, six years ago, um, rather unsuccessfully, um, but it wasn't just Verizon. I'd say all the telecoms had, had the same problem. Um, and uh, so we sold off those assets. Um, however, um, as of last week, we announced a partnership with AWS uh, related to um, the AWS Wavelength product, which is AWS is moving out to the edge um, and they have a couple products in that suite, Wavelength being the one that's actually stood up in our infrastructure. So that's what it means that it, AWS services are going out to the edge. Um, the advantage to AWS is obvious. Um, the advantage to Verizon, of course, is that that's a captive market. So we are offering services packaged up with AWS tools that will allow developers to create a plethora of new services. And um, you know, I can't wait to find out what they're going to be. <laughs> Good. Well done. 
Thank you. I, and I, I don't know who's next to you on the line, so yeah. no, no so you know, I really can't see. Who's coming? <coughs> Beth, you're on the end, are you? Yes, I'm on the end. And then next to you is? So we, we followed Smart. how you called us, and we're sitting now very well educated, exactly <laughs> in, the, in the right order. <laughs> go on, off you go. So hi, everyone. I'm Franz Seiser. I'm, I'm part of, of Deutsche Telekom Group. Uh, I'm there um, running architecture teams in the area of, of mobile core and cloud and service platforms. Um, and we've been part of, of the virtualization uh, journey right from the beginning as well. So there is a couple of others. We, we kicked off this NFV exercise. And of course, we went into it highly motivated. Um, now, different to the US, uh, Europe, we have in Europe uh, multiple countries. Uh, they are at different stages of development. So um, they are also in different levels uh, how they operate. And we still do have countries where we run uh, classical box type networks. Um, simply, you, you don't easily find a business case for uh, rep ripping that out and, and replacing it with something virtualized and cloudified if it's not uh, as part of the life cycle. Um, now we can debate for quite a while uh, what is the difference between virtualized and cloudified. Uh, I think we still mainly run, and maybe I, I, I'm a bit more strict here, in a virtualized manner, so it's VM-based. And, and why do I still call it virtualized? Because um, the operation model is still relatively classical, so to say. So we, we have not changed to a very software-driven um, operation model, simply because our biggest pain point, uh, uh, um, overarching automation orchestration platform, from my perspective, this is still the black spot we have. So we, we are pretty clear in the meantime on infrastructure. And yes, we have struggled there as well. Uh, as we know, ideally, we would have at least, I'm not saying one, one infrastructure platform, but, but one, one, one cloud infrastructure that's jointly operated and that deals with all the demands, a little bit like what you see from hyperscalers. Um, but due to various reasons, uh, inside of DT, we still have a few independent uh, cloud solutions, and, and they are done differently, which is, of course, putting us in the uh, good situation. We can, we can compare. How does it work when you buy everything from, from, from one integrator, so to say? How does it work when you have a joint responsibility? And how does it work when you try to do most of the things yourself? We know that needs to come together, but we are not there yet. So we are still trying to understand uh, how this works best. Uh, but one thing we understood is how awfully difficult it is uh, to bring applications on cloud platforms. And uh, even though they're all called OpenStack, they are not the same. <laughs> That's why we, uh, as one of the things we kicked off recently, is exactly uh, yesterday we mentioned it multiple times, and I'm sure Beth will do it again later. The thing <coughs> CNTT, where we say we, we need we need to have a somehow harmonized cloud platform across the operators, otherwise we will die out of complexity. But here we have a clear path on the automation orchestration piece. Uh, we are not that far, I would say, and that's a real pain point because this automation is so important for us, um, if not to say that's maybe even one of the drivers uh, going into that cloud direction, because we know it's getting more difficult, but on the other hand, you don't have an alternative. You have to run highly automated in such environment, otherwise you are, you are dead before you start it. And we are pushing that. And we have multiple projects. Some of them are, in the meantime, really far. And as we looked into it, we understood we better start with workloads that behave more like an IT application, because there we have less difficulties to bring it in the cloud. The ones we are still working heavily and scratching our heads are the ones which are more the heavy lifting uh, customer traffic machinery, where we still uh, have quite a bit ahead of us. How do we get that efficiently done? And then finally now we also have these this, uh, hyperscalers uh, coming around. Uh, especially also around the edge, because that seems to be the highly debated uh, area here. And we will have a session later. Um, and here we are stretching our heads again. So what is the right model uh, to work with them? Uh, do you partner? Do you compete? Uh, if you ask me, it will be both. Uh, in some areas, it makes more sense. You have to uh, partner. Otherwise, none will be successful. In others, we are still more 
not sure what it would mean, uh, how, how deep you want to go with them, or is this not something where re we really want to compete, because it's one of our key control points, how we call it, uh, to, to for, for our production machinery. So this is really one of the big questions. Still, we are very committed going down that route, uh, and, and, and we are still convinced this is definitely the right thing to go. And, and one of the signs is we are, we are now also starting, or we have, but it's, it's becoming more, more, more popular now, to bring similar concepts into the access. Because once we talk about things like access desegregation, that's, by the way, one of the few topics you have on the debate this year. I'm pretty sure we will have it next year here. <laughs> Uh, that's again a very much similar thing, um, trying uh, to bring it to smaller <coughs> pieces and, and, and run it on, on standard hardware, so bringing the concept of cloud even down to the access level. And now I better stop, otherwise I'm eating all the time. Thank you, okay. friends. Marcus, Swisscom. Yes, thank you very much to invite me here. Uh, like Beth, I was sort of like uh, cloud. I mean, exactly, we run clouds like uh, for years. Um, probably the sort of first cloud native project we were doing was the IPTV platform, something like 10 years ago. Um, we went then, if it went into more like the NFV sort of connectivity oriented services, we have done our first sort of like SD1 type of service for small and medium businesses. There really the business case was this sort of on-demand ordering, addition of features quickly, mm -hmm. things like that from a business perspective. We have just implemented that with the new capabilities of, of NFV and so on. Then uh, lately we, we went naturally for the mobile core. We run the mobile core on, on, on NFV at the moment. And we just a few weeks ago, we installed as a trial version the, the new standalone 5G mobile cores, which are sort of containerized and cloud native. But that's not production yet. We will, we will see how that goes. That gives you a bit of a, a, a gist on where we are on the networking side. On the more enterprise B2B type of, of businesses, um, we have been running in all types of virtualization, housing, whatever you want to call it, type of IT services. Naturally, there were also cloud-oriented offerings that sort of, but that's project business. I mean, we host it somehow, we do it somehow, different degrees of, of sharing, possible or not, not possible, all of that happened. Lately, we went pretty much down the path, which I think Telstra was talking about it as well, that we consult a lot with enterprise customers on their journey to the cloud. And not only to the cloud, their journey to dig uh, digitalization, basically, including cloud, connectivity, 5G, IoT, analytics. Uh, so these are the well-known words in the industry about digitalization. So there is a lot of confusion in the industry, and, and we try to, to, to capture that. Uh, interestingly, when we start advertising 5G, and we run 5G for, for some time now, um, the companies came to us and start asking about IoT. Sort of the 5G was sort of the initial thing that we get into massive discussion with a lot of different customers on what digitization and things like that mean. Before we had, we had like LTE, narrowband IoT, LoRa networks, all types of IoT type of platforms and networks, but only with 5G we got sort of the customer traction. Uh, in, in the sense. Not, not generated a lot of business so far, but it's, it's sort of the leads are, 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 are <coughs> quite massive at the moment. Thank and you. And probably finally, uh, yeah, as my role as, as, as being like chairing the Network Operator Council in the Etsy NFV thing, there we just now really started to also on the standard side work quite heavily on the cloud native versions, containerized versions. Have, have sort of standardized versions of that. It needed a bit more time than I was anticipating. <laughs> uh, I started that quite, quite early on because I knew we need that for 5G and, and SA and so on. And this it ties in with CNTT, perfect. Yeah, exactly, things, things like that. So um, that's, that's what, what has happened there as well. But now I think we are on, on standard side, we are also on the right, the right track to give a sort of a, uh, getting a certain agreement in the industry and sort of 
get everybody on the same page on what it actually means and to also have the, the products and services ready to, to sort of capture that. Good, thank you. Now I'm done. I apologize. <laughs> and Vittorio, Vittorio kindly stepped in. Mike Eels, unfortunately, couldn't join us today. So I think he, did he delegate to you, Vittorio? Or was it a, yeah, was did you volunteer? Of, I'm not sure. No, he asked me <laughs> last asked minute. So. <laughs> in a very polite uh, manner. Anyway, so, glad so, to be here. And I said we'd be gentle on you. So tell us about your role within 3. Yeah, so I, I work in the network strategy and architecture team at 3. And, and basically my role and my team's role is to uh, future-proof the network. So make sure that the network is ready, is, is ready to serve um, the customer in terms of services and, uh, and capacity and um, uh, in, a, in the cost-effective cost way. Um, so our uh, cloud journey started uh, probably four years ago when we realized that if we wanted to scale the network to the level um, uh, where the, 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 the forecast from the business uh, was going, uh, we had to drastically uh, transform the way we, we build the network. So we, we set out on a uh, transformation journey and the first thing we did is to define four key um, architecture principles for, for the new network. And, and the first principle was, uh, was about um, um, distributed topology. So we decided to move uh, from an architecture with um, three large-scale centralized data center to a topology with um, 20 smaller regional data center across the UK uh, where we would deploy all the network applications. And, and, and as well as we decided to um, push our transport network uh, further out into uh, hundreds of BT exchanges so we could uh, extend our presence to uh, basically where the customer is and uh, where the demand, the traffic demand comes from. Um, so the, the second principle was that all the network application would sit on a common um, NFV SDN um, infrastructure. Uh, so we didn't want to deploy any physical um, application in, in the new network. Um, and the third principle was about the OSS and BSS layer. We, we decided that our new OSS and BSS would, would sit in public cloud, leveraging um, infrastructure, platform, software as a service type of models. Uh, and, and the last principle, was, uh, crucially, is that we decided to, to deploy the, the, the new network and the new BSS uh, OSS stack. Um, with a kind of a um, greenfield approach. So we would uh, design, test, and deploy the new network, new BSS, um, fully validated. And uh, once it's ready to take operational traffic and customer, we would migrate um, from the legacy onto the new uh, network and stack. Um, so we, we started this journey, as I said, uh, to set, set in the principle around four years ago. And then it took a while to um, do the you know, partner selection, procurement process, and uh, mobilization of resources and partners. So I would say we are now probably in um, two, two and a half years into the, into the program. Um, we've got um, about 20% of the network traffic onto the new um, virtualized core network. And um, we are currently in um, friendly user trial for the for the new BSS stack. Uh, wow, good. And the, the, and is that something just doing here in the UK, or is that something that comes from yeah. parent organisation, or is that that's a UK? It's uh, just UK. Good, because I think the point that Franz made about. Um, organizations in different opcos and stuff that one thing we come across a lot in research is that you know the opcos as you said Franz are in very different stages depending on which country they're in to the point I made at the beginning which every country is is very different uh, and I think you know perhaps it's easier when you know Beth in, I know I know the US is apparently quite a big country so you know it's, it's a big challenge checked, to do yeah. all that but it's yeah. still you know but, and, and but, but Verizon itself is a global company I mean we're in uh, it's some argue, argument, but like 170 countries or so. So, so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the, one of the questions which springs to mind straight away is that, and we talked about this a little bit before the break, that this is, this is the coming together. Not, it's not just the future and evolution of the network. It's the IT side 
uh, and it's how the whole bus- different parts of the business work together. I mean, is, are we truly seeing that combination of the IT and the network organizations, or is that still v- at very early days? No, I, I, I do think we see that. So um, at, at least uh, when, when we looked into our cloud strategy, very early on, we, we, we said, if, if you look at it from a cloud perspective, uh, network control uh, is from a workload characteristics not too different to what you have from a standard IT application. We may have a bit more real-time uh, requirements, but, but fundamentally what you need is, is, is mainly compute. So, so there is a lot of similarity. So you, there is no reason, for example, to have an IT cloud and an NT cloud. You can bring it together. The only exception, as said, is a bit the, the, the heavy lifting of the, of the customer payload where there is still uh, efficiency not not on a similar level if you go to a standard x86 machine but as we hear we know there's a lot of innovation and work going on in the direction so it's getting better but it's not there yet especially if you also look on on, because one of the things we we tend to overlook very often is power consumption yeah and and we have an issue here and and i think um, especially in our days we also need to look what does it mean if you go there for, 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 for your um, climate footprint. So we have to also look strongly what, what do we do with all these things regarding um, power consumption. And what we see today still, usually if you go on, 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 on virtualized and cloudified environment, you are less efficient compared to specialized hardware. Yeah, it's, it's still a minor point today, but uh, we, we need to have that in focus and we need to drive that forward as well. But it is together. It doesn't. We don't see any reason why IT and NT should be should be separated. Yeah, our our organizations. I mean, there is an IT organization and there's a network planning organization. But they, I mean, I'm in the middle frequently. So we we have to work together. It's absolutely critical. And uh, in terms of the clouds, um, we do have a network cloud that's that's separate. That's the core, I would call it the core network cloud, which is where we run those network um, heavy applications. Um, and then we have a BSS OS cloud, but that's that's really not a change from what we were doing before. So um, uh, probably, probably like on the organizational part of, of it. So it's, I mean, technically you can do all of that. It's still sort of, we still have a bit of an organizational issue there. We try to overcome that uh, through going more agile so we have sort of turned the whole company upside down to be more agile, uh, using agile principles, uh, scaled agile, things like that, uh, organizationally, which makes it much easier to drag in expertise from IT into the network and vice versa, which before it was a hassle. You had to go up the organizational hierarchy. Uh, some guys need to talk about and then it took forever. So basically doing it sort of more agile, it, it, it helps to really get these things uh, near to each other. Well, let me, let me touch on that because we actually just did a, re, re, a complete reorg called Verizon 2.0 and it was announced last year. And uh, mostly uh, it was a rationalization between all our different network components because Verizon is a collection of random telecoms that got mashed together over a period of 25 years. And um, there was, uh, we literally were, were we, you know, we'd have the wireless sales team, and then we'd have the MPLS sales team, and then we'd have the wireline sales team. And well, that makes no sense because, you know, our customers just want to buy stuff from us, and they don't care, you know, is it wireless, wireline? They don't care. They just, they just want to buy connectivity. So, so the organizational reorganization basically pulls those those things together so that we have a much more coherent story to our customer that says, oh, you want to, you know, we could give you a comprehensive solution to your your networking. And if some of it's wireless, some of it's wireline, whatever it is, we can give it to you comprehensively. So, Vittorio, you were going to say something? Yeah, so I just wanted to say that um, at three we made a distinction between uh, uh, performance cl- critical application like the classical telco uh, five nines uh, application like EPC, IMS, and less critical in terms of performance like BSS, OSS. So that's uh, well, the distinction. Is. So we decided that performance critical will sit on on premise where we are in full control of the infrastructure. And, and less critical application can sit in public cloud. 
Okay. Uh, one of the things we, in, in research in this area that, that comes quite, quite clearly is the sort of the disconnect between the different parts of the business. So, you know, in the past, problems have been thrown over the wall into IT and we've used waterfall development and, and now we're moving towards DevOps. And we've had this collision between, I think someone called it two galaxies and something I saw yesterday of networking and IT. Uh, although I think Dean's dinosaur and meteorite probably are something in there as well. So th this issue about understanding throughout the organization about what it is we're trying to achieve. And it partly comes to a point you just made, Beth, which is that do we have enough visibility of what, not what the technology can do, but what is required from end to end? Because in many of the product discussions I have with, with, a different, with business and consumer, you know, their window is six months out, right? They've got a six month view of, of what products are coming down the line. Are, are we, and it goes back to this morning probably as well, that do we just not have a long enough long-term view are we, are we becoming so short-term focused that the different parts of the business are just not aware of the, capa of the possibilities of what 5G or broadband or whatever? I'd say it's just the opposite. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, Verizon's been in business, not as Verizon, but as a telecom for, what, over 100 years. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we absolutely have a long-term view. That's why we're investing all in all this 5G technology, um, because we're a technology company at the end of the day. Um, but what I find when I'm talking to customers is we have a longer view than they do. So, so you know, I'm thinking, oh, wow, you know, what they're saying is something we can turn into a product, but it might take a year. And, and but they're not even thinking of it as a product. They're just, you know, they're just kind of rambling. And, um, and they'll say, oh, well, can you do this, you know, this specific thing? Um, so I don't think they're thinking broad enough. They're not thinking about it. Yeah. Okay, cool. I can say something about um, So as I said in the beginning, uh, our role in, from a technology perspective is to try to future-proof the network. Right? So uh, we don't always have from the business uh, like a five, ten year view of what, what they want to do, what, what we're trying to achieve in terms of product services. So we try to build an architecture that is flexible and has got all the enablers um, so that we can do what the business may, may want to do in future. Like an example is I heard uh, earlier, my marketing director, Nick, is sitting there saying he's planning to charge customers for latency. Mm. Right? So I, I'm, re <laughs> yeah. I'm really glad that uh, we, we yeah. decided to build a distributed network architecture. So we've got, uh, you know, the enabling infrastructure so we can do that. Uh, so go ahead. <laughs> I think, I, I think our, I mean, our experience on, on that is, is yeah, it's a, diff, it's a difficult discussion really going on. I mean, you have two layers of discussion. You have sort of the, the business people talking with the customers and then the business people talking with the infrastructure guys. And they're really different timelines and sort of matching that together, getting the roadmaps and so on is a very, very difficult task. Um, we made the experience more that we, from a technology perspective, we need to show something. Huh? We need to set up first things, we need to park and so on, that there is sort of something there, probably do some sort of a minimal viable product first and then sort of enhance it, things like that. But then they want to buy it. I can't I tell you how many times we set up a park. They're like, okay, can we order a hundred of them? We're like, uh, we just set this up as a POC. <laughs> it's not a product. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that there, the mis miscommunication <laughs> yeah. comes, com comes in. But as, as, I mean, our suppliers uh, sell us stuff as a product as well, and it's mm. more of a POC. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, it, it happens all, I mean, it doesn't matter on what, what boundary. Right. But I think it's, a, it's getting it there. The, pro the problem is that the customers don't know what they want, really. So it's very difficult to make a network strategy based on that. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, so if you come from the network side and you could sort of envision what could be done, you can sort of at least tease it a bit or tease it on a bit. I think it, then the discussion starts and the negotiation starts and so on. So it's sort of a circle which yeah. needs to go on. But that's exactly one of the reasons, right, why we, why we go down this path of, of cloudification. Yep. To exactly escape that, you yep. have this nice spoke, but then this is surprisingly successful, let's put it like that, and then you don't have a clue how, how you will deliver the demand because building for scale typically in the, in the old world was not what you had in mind right. for a POC. You just wanted to show something works, but you didn't spend a lot of thought how do I scale it up. 
if you do that properly in a cloud environment, scaling up would be a few mouse clicks in an ideal world. I know. Yeah. Well, from the technology perspective, the problem is, is the operational perspective is what kills us. Yeah, we could, we could actually stand up a hundred of those things for our customer, but it would cost us a fortune because we'd have to, you know, have three senior network engineers actually doing it. <laughs> That's because we don't have proper automation in place. Yet. Yes. Because if you, if you even would have the proper automation and orchestration platform, which I tried to make, this is still, this well, is really my Well, but that's what we do. Point. We go back and yeah. do that. That's, yeah, that's what we do when we make it a product. Exactly. <laughs> and, and this is something you would need to think about up front because right. then you would, that, that's what I, tend to summarize as build for scale from the beginning. Right. Have in mind, it may happen that this thing is successful and you, you need to, to properly scale the thing. I think it's, it's a good point, the operational aspect yes, of, 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 of that. And how to build it. How to build it. I think there is a, a, a yeah, massive discussion everywhere on, on how that is done. I think we, we started with sort of the cloud technology on the bottom line mm -hmm. and now sort of build up into the upper stack, operational stacks, business stacks, and so on. And this will take a few, a bit more time. So here's a question for you. So given that we're surrounded by apparently, you know, signs of Christmas. So <laughs> is, cloud, is cloud native, and I don't mean perhaps cloud nativity, perhaps we should, we should think of here. <laughs> you know, is, it, is it the star that we are blindly following? You know, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> are, we, are we blindly following this journey? You know, and yet we're going to find we get there and we need to keep changing the journey. So what, what's, what's the barriers in the way of us getting towards this goal of, of being this new all cloudified CSP well, to go Well, back the to. fact that we can't even agree on a definition is probably not a good sign. <laughs> right. Doesn't help. Yeah. yeah. What, else, what else is in the way? Is it, it's, is it the way... Okay. Well, I mean, when we finish this session, we're going to have we're going to hear from four of the suppliers and how they're how they're changing and and helping you move towards that. You know. So, but I, one thing I'd like to put to you all is that at the senior level within the within the telecoms organisations, do the, do the board get this? Do the is this discussed at board level? Uh, unfortunately, yes. um, Orange. I was, I was talk, speaking with Marie Noel at Orange uh, last week. That they, they have an offsite meeting, so she couldn't join us today. But she said that more and more. She's been at the XCOM level. They're being asked more and more to talk about yes. about cloud and about what this can do for the business, yeah, I, not how it just transforms the network or the yeah, IT, yeah. but how it transforms the business. Yeah. So, are you getting those sort of level questions coming all the way down from, yes. from the board, or, or you, do you feel as though you're still working in isolation? No, no, uh, so, I, I can confirm this is really in the meantime it did end up on board level for different reasons. And B, they're asking why are we still talking? And where, where is it? Uh, but. The good news is it came it came to the to the attendance of the board level more and, and we had the discussion yesterday and I still stick to my point. The, the critical issue is not technology; it's people and processes and skills. And that, fortunately, at least for for for, for us, uh, arrived on, on board level. Because on the one side, the teams are under tremendous pressure to just keep the tremendously complex network up and running. At the same time, we ask them. And by the way, in your five minutes per time per day or whatever, we, we expect you to learn all these new technologies. How, how shall that work? work? We, we need to, to find better ways by either carving out people, identifying the ones which are most uh, eager to be re-educated re and, and, and upskilled. And this, in the meantime, has been come really to the attention and, and, and they understood the need, we need help from, 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 from the top level to, to get some freedom to move on, on, on that area. And that's, that's a very good news for me that this finally has arrived there and, and they understand it's not, it, there is some action required and, and some headroom to be given uh, to enable our teams to learn these things because you don't learn it overnight. You don't, you don't go home today as a legacy network engineer and you come back tomorrow as the yeah. uh, top cloud. Uh, that, that's not yeah. like how it works. You need to really understand how do you develop your workforce, what can you reskill, where don't you reskill, where do you hire fresh blood yeah. to come to, to a healthy mixture of that. So is it, is it being helped by the hyperscalers and the fact that AWS and Google, Google's making massive push into this area now, um, you know, or, or, or Azure, is, is it being helped by those sort of more web scale and, or, and indeed people like Salesforce, you know, who are fundamentally cloud-based providers, are they, they're getting the attention of people at board level, as well as obviously Apple and the, mm. and the like. Is that helping us or is that not helping us, Vittorio? Mm. Well, we, we're working with those hyperscale providers very closely. All our BSS applications, they run in uh, 
public clouds. You, okay. all, all the ones you mentioned are our partners. But, um, from a network perspective, for me, the, the driver for moving to cloud native is um, 5G standalone and the deployment mm -hmm. of the 5G core. Because for that, you don't have really an option because um, those 5G standalone applications, they are all cloud native. Sure. Uh, so they need to be um, stateless, uh, microservices based and run on containers. Um, and, and for a business like Tree, which is uh, primarily a consumer business, um, it's, it's been quite a challenge to justify um, investment in, in 5G standalone because um, you know, all the use cases that come with it, like ultra-reliable, massive MTC that don't really apply to, to consumer. Uh, but we think we found a way to justify and now we're preparing for, um, for, for a proof of concept of uh, cloud-native 5G standalone. So, and, and one, more, one more thing, so Verizon has, um, right at the board level, we've come up with, there's like a whole messaging, um, it's the eight currencies, you know, I'm a little tired of hearing about the eight currencies, but um, it's, you know, that are driving the, the build out of the 5G network, and they include automation, reskilling, so there's a whole new uh, emphasis on, on reskilling the, uh, the workforce, training them up, training up these engineers in new technologies and virtualization and cloud and, and, and all of that stuff. So, so it definitely is, is a very critical, seen as a very critical component yeah, so. of, of our invent, reinvention as a... As so who, a, who was uh, it yet? I, I'm, I'm I was, was it you, Marcus, yesterday yes. talked about the reskilling in, in a third, a third, a third? Or? Yes, exactly. So it's, it's, it's I mean, to, to, to your question, I think it's a yes and a no. So from a board level, it's sort of like a good example. Before we went all down that sort of agile way and so on, we also visited, board, board visited some of the hyperscalers to see how they are doing it. And that was sort of the push towards the personnel transformation part of it. And then sort of cloud nativeness is sort of just the technological foundation helping mm -hmm. with all, all, all of that uh, uh, change. And I say also it doesn't help. That's probably, I'm not sure whether it's like a Swiss uh, uh, issue and a Switzerland issue. The hyperscaler, uh, they hired the good guys knowing about that technology. So, I mean, Google has massive amount of people hired. Uh, uh, Amazon has a massive amount of people hired in, in, in Switzerland. So it's not, not terribly helpful to compete for talent. <laughs> In, yeah, well, in, 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 the, in that area. Yeah, we, we ended up building our own talent, actually, at the end of the day. And, and of course, we have a lot of, we built up the skills in OpenStack and, and, and those types of and containers and Kubernetes. So we, um, and we don't tend to be in Silicon Valley, so we don't have to compete <laughs> with those people as much. Uh, so we ended up, yeah, it was, it was like, because the specialized knowledge around the network stuff is, does not occur in, and Google and Amazon, they just, you know, it's a top of rack switch as far as they're concerned. It's just it's and, some any magic. other barriers. Sorry, any other barriers in particular? With so, with, I think we decided technology is not uh, organizational issues. Yes, especially in the larger ones where that sort of frozen middle of management where things don't necessarily get through where they're protecting themselves. The other issue which which came across a little bit is is is, is in fact this is even though you still have to hold later on, this is of course a long-term journey because skill and culture transformation doesn't happen overnight. But at the same time, of course, uh, we and, 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 and the whole organization, as we are a public company, we are of course bound by, by uh, quarterly reporting and the numbers have to be right and because and, and, and your, your, your stock price is important. So you cannot easily invest uh, three digit million sum into building up something long term because it kills your 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 your, your short term balance sheet so and to find the right how do you start to invest in something that takes some time to 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 really deliver versus also complying with your with your demands on on, on the financials in the short term that's always a difficult discussion because very often if the project has to deliver something they need to look for the most cost efficient solution which in many of the cases, is not what you would like to do from where you want to develop the whole thing long term. So you always have a lot of interesting discussions. How do you bring these both things together? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and 
of course it's a barrier, but there is no easy solution to okay. that one. So I, I was suggesting to the team through a messaging that we should have questions at the end, but I'm told you have so many questions you want to raise now. Okay. Graham, do you want to see it? Let's, uh, let's see if anybody's got any questions for our expert. <coughs> you got a microphone on? Yeah, I... Oh, good. Yeah. Look at this. Here we go. Ready? Over to you. So let's have a couple of questions, and then we'll hear from the suppliers, and then we'll come back to the debate. So. Super. Okay. So, uh, yes, William's got a question William? over here. <laughs> okay, so a um, couple of quick questions. Firstly, does the move towards the edge make the cloud problem? If you're, if you're putting more computing into the network, the fact that you're actually at the same time trying to take it out of the network, doesn't that, isn't that a sort of bit of contrary? And secondly, if it's actually really more just to do with the OSS and BSS, how significant is this in terms of overall OPEX of the network? Can we park part. your first question until the final debate after the break that around the edge, uh, but on the, the BSS, OSS? I quickly answer the edge, edge question anyway, because at Swisscom we are edge, so it's not yeah. like a I, big I, deal for us. I, yeah, I would say <laughs> a WAN network is edge. Mm -hmm. We've been there a long time. <laughs> okay, then the second question was? It was OSS, BSS, and, op, and uh, OPEX. I mean, I think we, sp we spent still uh, most of the money in COPEX building, building out network infrastructure. And sort of the operational costs, it's, 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 it's yeah. I mean, we, the, the hope is that cloud nativeness is decreasing the amount of money we need to spend on that. Yeah. And I have to admit, so far for us at least, this is a hope. Well, <laughs> I, I should put it in perspective. I mean, we've been delivering services to literally hundreds of millions of people for a long time. So, um, you know, obviously we've been driving costs out for decades. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I see it as just a continuation of, of the mechanisms that we use to drive costs out and it's just continuing, so. Okay, uh, so somebody over here had a, yeah, this gentleman here had a, his hand up. Uh, hello, Matt Jones and Ericsson. I, I have both a comment and, and a question at the end. Uh, I think we have been working with a lot of CSPs over the years building the clouds. And, and since the topic of this debate was how long does it take, etc. Our experience, we, we did a survey uh, published uh, on, our, on our website in April. Uh, three to four years is what it takes to even get, st from start to plan, till you get something going. And then it takes another couple of years until you, in the best of worlds, have 80% of traffic running. Those 80% are typically easy traffic, like control signaling, things like that. So it, it, it is rather a long journey. You're, you're a bit ahead of the game, because when, when we've heard from the suppliers, then we'll debate that, but that, that's, that's good input for that later on. Right. Uh, uh uh, okay, we'll go right over there to Dean. I think, well, anyway, oh, my, my, I think my okay. question to the panel was Oh, that, sorry, I do beg your pardon. <laughs> my question was, uh, and since many, a lot of the challenges has been in, in building the NFVI in various ways, best of breed, etc. So my, I think my question is, would you, uh, in retrospect of, of you know, how, how challenging it's been, would you have been doing it otherwise if you would have started it over again? And... On, on a, on a follow-up, since no one is completely done yet, how, how long time will it take until you are <laughs> almost 90% done with you know, having an orchestration, multi-vendor, VNFs, et cetera? I, I'm gonna hold that again, because I wanna bring that back in after we've heard from the, from the different vendor presentations. But I forgot the first bit. Uh, right, okay, well, we'll go for one last question, I think, from Dean, and then we'll move on to the next session. Dean, by the way, has tweeted about my shoes. I heard so, that. What's uh, so special yeah, about uh, your shoes? Um, so, thank you very much. <laughs> They're not very polished, red. Yeah. Thank you very much for tweeting about my Did shoes. Did you put Dean. the wrong ones on? <laughs> always, always approve disruptive footwear. Um, a question for the panel. Is the focus on NFV for the sort of core part of the network, is that more or less important than cloudifying the RAN? We haven't heard as much about the sort of radio network virtualization or the access network virtualization. Okay, so core, so core versus RAN, cloudification. I think you have to start somewhere. Yeah. 
and it 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 sounded like the the the, the apple which is hanging lower than the, than the ran the ran one. The the core is easier. Um, we have virtualized some of the ran, but there's there's just some logistics problems in terms of the performance and the software. You know, it, the vendors are still very much tied to the hardware, so. Uh, that's, I think it's just a chicken and an egg question. Yeah. And for, for me, um, I'm more a core network guy, so for me, you know, core network <laughs> virtualization is, is important, but in order to do run virtualization, um, you really need access to dark fiber in, in, the, in the access network, the backhaul. And, and, uh, and we, we, don't, we are not there at the moment. Right? We don't have dark, dark fiber. We're working on it. But once you have access to, to dark fiber, then it becomes a no-brainer. So you want more of Howard's fiber. That's what you really want. Yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> Good. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close that there. But please bear in mind um, the gentleman Erickson's question about how long the journey is. And we'll come back to you when we've heard from the suppliers and come back. But for the time being, thank you very much to Beth from Verizon, to Franz from Deutsche Telekom, Marcus from Swisscom, and Vittorio from 3. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.